Regular uh, council meeting on January 27th. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to, to order. Uh, recommendation that the regular meeting be suspended and the committee of the whole meeting be convened. Uh, moved by Councillor Moreau, seconded by Councillor Aidy. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, all in favor? All opposed? Carried. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting of the Committee of the Whole together. Uh, and uh, first I'll read the uh, statement of the chair. The chair will then ask council members if they have any questions. Uh, remember, there will be no decisions made at this meeting on any requests or concerns you have made. Lastly, requests will be referred to staff for review, report, and recommendation to council. Council meetings are very full, and we would appreciate your cons consideration of your time and allotment. Uh, Recommendation that the agenda for the Committee of the Whole meeting of January 27th be adopted as circulated. Uh, moved by Councillor Moreau, seconded by Councillor Randawa. All those in favour? Any opposed? Okay, first we have a uh, petition and delegation. We have the Cayenne Island Trail Enhancement and Recreation so Society uh, Community Update. Hi there. Um, we do have a slideshow, so do we just fire it up on there? Okay. Okay. Perfect. I think you're up at the top, maybe. Awesome. Okay. So um, good evening, Acting Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Francis Riley. This is Steve Milam. And we are here before you today as representatives of the Cane Trails Society. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come before you. We're here with a short update regarding our recent activities, as well as uh, some next steps for trail development within our community. So, Cane Trail's master plan involves several stages, the first of which is the development of what we call the phase one loop. This multi-use trail will li link the more urban areas of Cane Island with coveted waterfront and wilderness destinations like the Butsy Rapids area and the Tall Trees Trails, as well as Oliver Lake. It will do so by utilizing some existing trail corridors and creating new ones. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Rushbrook Trail and walk it every day. The revitalization of the area has been a great success and a positive addition to Prince Rupert. The average daily use is approximately 100 people per day and recent community feedback indicated that 100% of the users would recommend it to friends, family and visitors. Uh, Cane Trails has also organized regular bi-weekly maintenance as well as larger trail spruce ups. 
and the design of the trail has been working well to ensure user safety. Along the next, or among the next steps outlined above, Kane Trails is really eager to continue working with the city to improve the trailheads at the Rushbrook Floats end and the Seal Cove Slough end. The McClymont Trail, it's also an integral part of the phase one loop um, in that it's an important pedestrian commuter trail that links the waterfront with the Civic Center. It sees extremely high usage even in its current condition. Um, so Kane Trails has explored its options for revitalization of this trail, but unfortunately due to the fact that it's a critical utility corridor for the city, our society does not have a strong position when applying for grants towards a trail project in this area. There is federal and provincial funding that the city could access, and we would be more than happy to work with the city on this trail, but ultimately it's not one that our society can spearhead. A section of the phase one loop that we are super excited about is the rail trail. So this links the Seal Cove end with, uh, of the Rushbrook Trail to the Butsy Rapids and Tall Tree area. Um, it accesses some really beautiful waterfront, um, which people uh, do request a lot in our user feedback. Um, it's comprised largely of the same railway corridor that Rushbrook Trail used, as well as part of the old Highway 16. It's a really beautiful area, um, more, or more waterfront access, but the potential route is a little tricky because federal, provincial, and municipal title is all involved. Um, the province is on board with our proposed route. The city has expressed some reservations due to its proximity to the ongoing Showatlands projects. Um, so currently we have begun engaging the federal government regarding the Sourdough Bay area and we intend to continue engaging with First Na Nations and the industrial parkland owners. That all being said, we have decided to focus our main next efforts on another section of the phase one loop that we believe has greater potential for a quick turnaround. So the Cloudberry Trail is our current focus. Uh, we intend this trail to be multi-use, supporting walkers, hikers, people on bikes, and wheelchair users. Um, this route will run along the mountain side of the highway and connects the Civic Center area with Buttsy, Tall Trees, and Oliver Lake. It has some wonderful mountain views and an abundance of cloudberries, hence the name. Land title in this area is largely provincial, making a uh, designation of this area a lot easier than the previous sections. Um, this trail will also allow users to access multi-activity uh, areas without using a vehicle. So the beaches at Grassy Bay and Butsy Rapids, lake uh, access at Oliver, mountain hiking trails, as well as the proposed mountain bike trails that are currently being championed by the, uh, the new mountain biking society in town. So we really believe there's a strong opportunity to move forward with this trail. And to that end, Steve will speak to the funding side of things. Thank you, Francis. Um, great summary. And as uh, Francis noted, we're really excited about the Clou Cloudberry Trail. We see tons of potential. And um, even with recent surveys, uh, the general public are also showing a lot of support for that trail. So before I get right into the funding, I want to make a quick note of the redesign Rupert process that took place last year. There were six or seven main focus groups, uh, such as retail and housing, uh, but one of them was wilderness and environment. Uh, that was one of the key um, focus, focus points of, of that uh, process. And so that's significant, and it, even more so, it was pulled out of the parks and recreation um, focus group because uh, Larry Beasley recognized and, and mentioned over and over, really, how Prince Rupert's location is in a park-like setting, and we're one of very, very few places in the world that can really say that in a genuine way. So we have something really worth, um, th that will really make Prince Rupert great. Um, and so accessing that wilderness uh, and environment is a key key point. So to that end, uh, local industry and, and the city has, uh, and everyone here, I think, recognizes that. and. Um, everyone's pretty on board with um, getting trails built around here. Um, local industries uh, 
even starting to knock on our door a little bit, asking what, what our next project is and, and how they can be involved. So, so that's excellent. Um, so we're, and we're getting to the stage where we're getting ready to move. Um, so, th but the next, as you can see, the next uh, few projects are, are really big. Um, each leg will be at least as expensive or more than the Rushbrook Trail. So we're looking at probably two or three million for most of those sections of trail. Um, so we don't want to just be picking the pockets of local industry and not really anyone else. So we know there's um, some large pots of money provincially and federally that we really want to access. Um, and uh, so specifically there's one that's for 500,000 each year from the province through the active transportation infrastructure grant this was was the bike bc grant and it's transitioned into the active transportation infrastructure grant there's other federal and provincial grants that we can match to this so we'd like to get in the position where we have uh, a million or close to a million dollars of um, government money before we start asking industry so this is great. Um, it suits our trail network really well. And there's just one barrier that we're facing. Um, the city has to have an active transportation strategy. Um, and without it, we're not able to apply. So <coughs> what is an active transportation strategy? It's BC's strategy for a cleaner, more active transportation. Um, this program rolled out in the summer of last year. Uh, the province tra uh, provided training workshops all around the province last fall. I attended uh, one of these conferences in Terrace uh, last November, and um, there were probably 25 to 30 others in the room with me there, um, all from Terrace, Kitimat, Hazleton, Houston, Smithers. Um, pretty much every municipality had uh, some staff there as well as uh, consultants from, from their, their towns. Um, unfortunately, there was not anyone else besides me from Prince Rupert. So um, this just flagged, flagged us uh, that uh, although we know the city is a big supporter of our trail plan and getting trails built here, uh, we're all going to miss out on this big pot of money that's available if we have this strategy in place. Um, so we did some homework. This is, a, this is a good news story. We did some homework and dug up. There's two grants available. Um, uh, to support getting an active transportation strategy done. The first is due on February 20th. Do I need to, yeah. oh, no, I, I was there, Never mind. Um, so the first is due on uh, February 20th, which is why we're uh, presenting here tonight uh, because there's only a few weeks uh, it, that we could jump on this and, and get this done. Um, I s also spoke with Urban, Syst uh, Urban Systems. They helped us with our master trail plan and they've been writing active transportation strategies for other municipalities around BC. And these cost uh, between 30,000 and 125,000, um, depending on the level in of engagement um, that they, they're involved in. So a high, high end advanced plan, they're going to be uh, like monitoring traffic, tracking how numbers of traffic and pedestrians and cyclists and doing a really in-depth review, uh, lots of public consultations um, and meeting with staff and, and council often probably a cheaper plan uh, will be more basic but still focus on uh, pedestrian and cycle traffic um, so with this in mind getting an active transportation strategy completed for prince rupert is so important to cane trails because it opens these doors to big wads of cash <laughs> that we can get trails done um, that uh, our board uh, agreed at our last meeting that we would commit up to $2,500 to help the city uh, tackle this strategy. Um, so the, you can see the grants table up here. Uh, if, our, if a plan comes in under $100,000, it could, would be 100% covered by the first two grants there. Um, if you wanted to get the creme de la creme of uh, strategies, it would be $125,000. Um, so with K and trails throwing in a little bit, uh, the city would have to dig up another 10,000. So really good bang for the buck if you went, if you wanted to go to that highest extent. But again, talking to urban systems, uh, a $30,000 plan would still open those doors to the, to the, uh, the funding. So that's uh, kind of where we're at. That's our summary. And um, we were our basically, we were hoping to bring a motion to tonight's meeting. Um, but we understand we can't, so we would just uh, like council and staff to be aware of the situation. Uh, and maybe if you, as you go into your 
next into your meeting if you're able to uh, amend your agenda to consider this topic and um, if we can get a grant into that first uh, $50,000 pool they're pretty much shoe ins uh, both grants are made es essentially for developing active transportation strategies for cities that don't have them thank you very much for your time thank you uh, thank you for Thank you for all your work, and uh, I, I, I don't know if we can get it into tonight's meeting as far as the motion goes, but uh, I'm sure we can get staff to, to look into this and see where, if they can come up to us for a solution with Wonderful. It. And uh, thanks again. Is there any questions from any members of council? <laughs> uh, first, am I on? Yeah. 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 First of all, I, I'd like to say, um, as part of the redesign Prince Rupert planning sessions, I got to be a part of that group. And I'm sure all of the groups were just as much fun as ours was. Yes. But I don't know that from any experience, but ours was a lot of fun and it was really, re I loved the enthusiasm of it. I also love the concept because um, you, we, we live in this beautiful place and creating a, a, a way to access it that doesn't involve walking along the highway strikes me as a really good thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm all in favor of all of that. The one question I have is, let's say we succeed and we take all of those plans for interlocking all of those different ways to go and we create it in a way that mountain bikes can use and walkers can use, which is all good, then what? Because um, there's a trail down f at the end of Graham Avenue near where, where I am where you can walk all the way through to Moresby, but it isn't really a trail anymore. You kind of have to know yeah. which way to go, and my dog knows how to, how to get there, so I follow him. <laughs> it's the maintenance after the fact that I think to me is, is the challenge. You can, you can build it, but you also have to maintain it. So you guys talked about there, um, <coughs> uh, there was a, a section there in one of the first slides about maintenance and what was involved yeah. in that, like weed whacking four times a year and all, all that yeah. kind of stuff. So the bigger it gets, the more of that there is. Yes. So I'd like to think that somewhere in the planning process there is that piece that is also being planned for. Because, th you know, at some point you strain the abilities of volunteers, right? Absolutely. So that's uh, it's kind of an open question. I don't know that sure. you have I, I have a small, re uh, short response that I'll answer. I'll, I can answer part of that anyways. Uh, specifically regarding the Cloudberry Trail, it's, it is all on provincial land. There, there, there's a good chance that um, we'll work with the province to develop that trail and because it's on provincial land um, that they would take, take on a lot of the maintenance um, costs just as like they do with uh, butts and tall trees um, because those are on provincial uh, property. So that's, that's an easy one. The other ones though, um, obviously McClamont Park, that's uh, municipal. Uh, route so that one um, I believe would be by the city which they already do with the utility corridor and the other one it's all mixed so that would be likely volunteers in, in, in a big way there but uh, yeah definitely part of our process though as we move along and just to follow up presumably if we, you know the grand plan and the population increases that also increases the volunteers yeah absolutely. one would hope yeah um, so what if I'm understanding correctly, the, the February 20th piece is the one that there's a certain amount of urgency to. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I would support whatever we need to do to get to where we, we, we put that on an agenda that we can, we can talk about how to support that. So Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for your guys' time. And I mean, obviously, for all the time that you spend in volunteering to make this Trail Society a success, it's really much appreciated. Uh, Councillor Eighty actually got to my question around the maintenance piece of, of the Cloudberry piece, but which, by the way, is a phenomenal name. Uh, <laughs> I guess my, my only comment then really is, uh, I, I think just in terms of the timing, an active transportation plan would be really valuable information as you guys know we're moving forward with a new uh, official community plan yes and that'll be valuable feeder information in that process as well so i think it's all consistent it's all linked um, so totally. i think your timing is fantastic thanks very much thank you we had it on the slide but i didn't have time to mention it but yeah it would slide right into your your official community plan yeah update which would be perfect yeah anybody else <coughs> Councilor Cunningham. 
Your your volunteer base is pretty limited right now, I believe, is it? Yes and no. We actually have a lot of people asking to help and we don't have enough work for them at the moment because we're not able to, we don't have the permits in place to work on the trails that we're wanting to. So we've only been able to really flag and do some minimal brushing just so we can walk them and kind of show people. But once we get into the trail building and have more than just the Rushbrook Trail to, uh, to do, we'll be able to have, uh, yeah, we actually have, I would say, 60, 40 to 60 people who have, we, we have a mailing list of people who are getting a newsletter, about 140 people on our mailing list. And yeah, so lots of interest. And if anything, we're feeling a bit of guilt that we don't have enough work for them yet. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, I really appreciate the effort you put in because I've, I've walked the Rustbrook Trail and met people from California, Mexico, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they're just amazed, you know, like uh, they, they didn't even realize it was there until it was pointed out to them. And I think tourism, Prince Rupert's going to have to get on the ball and start letting people know about this trail systems and that because it's it'll be a feature that'll <coughs> attract people to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys for your time tonight and the presentation. And I think I speak for everybody that none of us uh, preemptively or early access to that uh, trail before it was done. So I, I, I won't admit on the record that uh, we accessed it early, but it's, it's a phenomenal trail. And I applaud you guys on the work that you guys are doing. And it's a very integral part. And it's obviously good timing. And uh, let's get some more work for those volunteers then. Okay. Sounds great. Sounds good. Thanks. Now, if there's anybody else that would like to come forward and speak about any subject, uh, this will be your first call. Just one comment. Don't feel that you have to stay for the whole meeting if uh, you don't want to. <laughs> I, I know it's riveting, but uh, feel free to go if you, if you choose. I, I wanted to use the question period for uh, to talk about uh, the Hayes 3.0 plan. <coughs> so I, I think it's been mis, mis, it's been forgotten that we sort of have a seismic exclusion zone. There's signs all around town. Uh, if, if in case go above this, uh, and I think it's about five meters, there's various signs around town. But when I look at the, uh, the Hayes 3.0 sign, uh, there's a lot of development down there. And so I'm, I'm thinking uh, that uh, a, we should, we should be paying more attention to not building down there. It's showing, when, when you look at the drawings and stuff, there's all kinds of new buildings and stuff going, but you'd, you'd have to see whether they're above 15 feet or something like that. So uh, th then the second thing is, with, with uh, climate change and that, we're liable to see the, the ice on Greenland melt, and that would mean that the sea level would come up quite a bit in, in a short period of time. So that would mean that even our seismic exclusion zone uh, would have to come higher. So we don't want to be building in there, and we don't want to we don't want to be changing the OCP so you can build in there and stuff like that. Um, and which I want to bring in closing, there was a and it's probably most of you won't remember, but some people do. Uh, we had a, a seismic incident in Alaska in 1964, and it came in and wrecked boats and stuff like that. So it has happened. It's, it's, put, it's potentially going to happen again, and it should be coming into the OCP. And this vision of 2030 should, uh, should include the idea that climate change might be raising the, uh, the sea level quite a bit. So you'll have to be even looking further at the exclusion zone. So A, you don't want all these buildings being built in that area, and especially you don't want uh, residential built in that area, and B, somehow we should be looking towards the climate change. Thank you. Just one comment for you, Larry. Um, so I don't know if you were, if you read the study that the, that the city had got done about uh, the tsunami, uh, the, the tsunami study, uh, but there's some good information in there for you to probably have a look through because, because it actually states in that, you know, basically, for the most part, the town, you know, railway, um, pretty well, mostly everything is 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 free and clear of, of tsunami damage. So it would be a good read for you just to have a read through it. Okay. Are we talking? Um, 
And I did read the previous one, but so are we talking about a new one or? It, it was done, I'm gonna say, probably six months ago, maybe about okay, that. Okay, so a new one. Yeah. Yes, it, we would look at, and I would say, uh, uh, it, excuse me, I've written many, I've written several scientific papers. You can write anything you want, then it's gotta go through a, uh, a critical review. And I'm suspecting that what you wrote didn't go through a critical review. So yes, I will look at it. And B, I suspect it's, it's not going to look at A, Greenland's ice melting and all the rest of that. Secondly, I, I'm skeptical if it looked at the 1964 uh, tsunami event. Okay, but I will look at it. Yeah, it's definitely worth reading because it, it's um, it, it was modeling that was done uh, by a by a group that was hired. Uh, we got some money through a grant, and we hired these people to do a study. And they, I mean, I guess uh, I guess everything you know can be looked at from different angles, but it it was a very good uh, you know study to to explain you know what what would go wrong or what could go wrong and and we actually came you know there was not a lot of bad for us in that in comparison to say something like uh what was it port alberni where the water came in there and did a lot of damage during that it's a lot of this depends on what the state of the tide is yeah. so that's why uh it's so high the one that did come through and caused all the damage it didn't come through on a high tide yeah. and so uh and secondly i'm suspect i suspect they did not look at the uh change in sea level uh, so what the high tide would be even even just the change without the seismic I would start looking at uh, maybe moving back in your official community pan just because once if you get Greenland melting and stuff like that it's going to make a world of difference and so uh, yes I'd like to see this uh, so this so-called report and you sort of get what you pay for okay thank you Is there anybody else that would like to speak to council about any subject? Uh, good evening. My name is Chris Lightfoot. I'm from Complete Streets for Prince Rupert. Uh, I, I came to address um, the staff uh, in support of the Cane Trails um, Active Transportation Plan proposal. I don't think we need any more extra wind in the sails behind that already. I'm so glad to hear um, about um, uh, you know the the fever behind it. Um, just wanted to say a few things, though. Uh, so, an active transportation plan lays out the steps and opens the funding opportunities um, for making Prince Rupert more walkable, bikeable, and easier to get around for everyone. And these are factors that improve the quality of life in communities like ours. So, Larry Beasy commended Prince Rupert at the presentation for already acting so quickly on many of the proposals from redesign Prince Rupert and that um, having an active transportation plan on the list of redesign uh, and the Sustainable City 2030 um, is, uh, is one of the things to do. And now is a great time to begin uh, that active transportation plan. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak to anything about to council? I will call a second time. And final time. That being no one else, I will, um, oh, I will, um, oh, actually, uh, uh, is there any questions from anyone else? Okay, Councillor Moreau. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just have a procedural inquiry for, for uh, the city manager here. So uh, based on Cane Trail's request uh, and knowing that we can't pass a motion in the community of the whole, is it best to add that as an agenda item or is that something that uh, you feel confident enough as a staff to be able to manage without a council endorsement? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think uh, what we have to do here is we're, we will be coming forward with the budget, so we need to put this in the context of the overall budget. Make sure that fits in, and that's, what is that coming for? Okay, so we could bring it forward February the 10th. Okay, do you, do you need a motion to that effect? or? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. okay, thanks. Is there anybody else that has any questions? Not seeing any, I would like a motion to adjourn to reconvene to the regular council meeting. Moved by Council 80, seconded by Council Rondawa. All those in favor? <laughs> Forgot that again.
Any opposed? Yeah, I just, just just make the decision. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, adoption of the agenda. A recommendation that the agenda for the regular council meeting of January 27th, 2020 be adopted as presented with the amendment to remove 3A. Moved by Councillor Rendala, seconded by Councillor Cunningham. All those in favour? Any opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, 3B, recommendation that the minutes of the regular council meeting of January 13th, 2020 be adopted. Councillor Cunningham, first, seconded by Councillor Eighty. All those in favour? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, now we have uh, petitions and delegations. We have uh, 4A, uh, RCMP situations, tables, presentation with Shannon Tucker. So we'll just be a minute here as Shannon is joining us, I believe, by phone, and she will have a presentation on the screen. Good evening, Shannon. Hi, Shannon. This is Shannon Tucker. I'm the Just be a moment, Shannon. We're just having a little bit of technical difficulties. Okay, Shannon, we're we're ready. Excellent. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and thank you for Rosa for all the wonderful work you're assisting me with the slide transition. Thank you, I really appreciate that. So I think we can kind of move on to the first slide. <laughs> this is a situation we will review. So what I'm gonna do tonight is just sort of walk um, council through the model and to have sort of a refresher from the session that we hosted in August uh, when I attended Christopher's on uh, Wake Ward and Councillor Amy, I believe you were there as well, and we actually had technological issues there as well. Um, we were all kind of cuddled around a laptop, so it's going to be nice for us to walk through this one together. Uh, Rose, if you could go to the next slide. Are we on context? Yes. So it seems to us through is that the Office of Crime Reduction and Gang Outreach in the Ministry 
state public safety systems in general, uh, would be the ones championing the model. And to just provide some context as to how we inherited this portfolio, um, there's a really good panel on crime reduction that was um, basically a stakeholder engagement session that happened across the province a few years ago with the Liberal government. And what we found across the board, and this won't come as a surprise to any of you, is that social, social justice sector partners were tired of the disjointed approaches. Um, five people helping one person, but not in a consolidated effort. So that person was never really getting the intense support that they needed. Um, working in silos and not being able to share information or being unsure if they were allowed to. And so what we sort of took from that engagement was that across the board, all of our partners were looking for support and direction to help agencies build and sustain those multi-sector collaborations. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So why is more collaboration needed? Um, collaboration traditionally has been reactive. So we have a lot of sort of hub models or partnerships or um, initiatives that happen after somebody is an offender or after someone has become a victim. So we'll notice that police interact with a lot more than just that simple dichotomy of people. So about 50 to 70 percent of calls for service um, are for issues that are non-chargeable and not criminal in nature. So for example, somebody um, is using substances or is, or is intoxicated. Um, somebody gets phoned because they're panhandling. Uh, homelessness, anything related to mental health and poverty generally, there's not a lot that the police can do in response to those unless somebody is in jeopardy of hurting themselves or somebody else. So we don't want to criminalize vulnerable people. And vulnerable people require services that the police are unable and untrained to provide. And so what we're finding is that these vulnerable people are not reconnected to services until they basically become a victim or an offender. And we're trying to get around that with this model. Are there any questions at all up until this point? Not yet. Okay, thank no. you. Now, next slide, please, Rosa. So building on that concept, what we'll see is on the left-hand side, that represents sort of the traditional sort of approach that we use um, with responding to people. And what we're trying to do on the right-hand side is really focus on that yellow layer, which is the risk intervention. So we're really trying to help people before the incident response. And with the situation table, we define an incident response as basically any negative outcome. So that could be criminalization or victimization. That could be overdosing or getting evicted from your residence or losing custody of your children. So it's anything sort of negative that would typically result in sort of a government or police response. Uh, next slide, please. So what is a situation table? So a situation table, sometimes they're also referred to as hubs um, in Ontario and Saskatchewan. They're a model that identify and reduce the risks present in the lives of vulnerable people. So what this table enables agencies to do is proactively identify risks through real-time information sharing, leverage and coordinate existing community assets and relationships, plan and deliver collaborative interventions before that incident response is required, and ultimately reduce the level of risk with which vulnerable people are living. And that last point is important because we really meet people with where they're at. So I'll give you an example. Um, if somebody is homeless and, and is being perhaps victimized in the homeless camp that they're residing at, if they choose to remain homeless, our goal is to make sure that they're safe. So we're not here to pass judgment. We're not here to sort of force you into supportive housing or anything like that. We just want to make sure that you're okay. So we're really meeting people with where they're at and just reducing that immediate harm to them. Next slide, please. So who do situation tables serve? So the situation table clients have to meet a certain threshold uh, to be considered eligible to receive sort of the services of the table. So the, the terminology that we use as a bit of a catch-all, uh, recognizing that a lot of different agencies have different terms um, for sort of priority clients, uh, for example, social chronics or at risk or high risk. Um, these three elements ensure that everybody who's at the table, so the school district, the police, the health authority, et cetera, we all know generally the, the same terms that we're working with, so that we keep it standardized across the board as to who we screen and why. So these three criteria are what we use to, to sort of allow people into the table. So acutely elevated risk means that the risk factors that a client is struggling with are beyond the scope of any two agencies. So this can't be solved through a simple partnership. This is a bit more complicated than that. So three agencies or more are required to intervene. 
what we've seen in BC so far is that a client typically has nine risk factors. So these are people that need quite a bit of help from a broad spectrum of stakeholders. Number two indicates that recent events have increased the probability of harm or victimization. And this sort of ties in with the next point, which are that conditions have reached a point where a crisis is foreseeable. And where we see this happen a lot um, is that the school district will start noticing that a child is coming to school and they're in sort of a bad mood. And then a child's coming to school and their hygiene is, is, getting, is getting worse. And then the child's coming to school really late and then the child is just not coming to school. So we're seeing that kind of escalation in severity where something's not quite right. And what we've learned from our school district partners is that when something's not right with a child, something's always bad at home. So that means that either perhaps dad has lost his job or a parent is sick or something's not quite right there. So sometimes we can use the child as an intervention for the entire family. But that's just an example of how we kind of see things that, that basically you're going down a bad path and it's going to get worse unless you, until you get some help. Next slide, please. So how does the situation table operate? Um, participating agencies, and I have a slide where I kind of go through um, who typically sits at the table. Um, you meet regularly for 60 to 90 minutes. Regularly can depend on your community. Um, some communities meet once a week uh, for the full hour and a half, for example, like a Surrey. Some communities meet every two weeks uh, for half an hour, and that's, that works really well for them. Each situation takes about six to eight minutes to discuss. And we have a special, like an information sharing filtered structure that ensures that all of your conversations stay on track using a four filtered approach and that you don't share any information that you don't need to. It's just, it's kept very lean. We use an information sharing protocol to determine if the referred client is living with that criteria that I just mentioned, the acutely elevated risk. So if you find that your client meets that threshold for acutely elevated risk, you would accept the client to the table, and then all of the relevant agencies would share sufficient information to determine the risk factors, and you would intervene quite quick, quickly thereafter. So, for example, if I'm the police and I bring someone to the table and I say, you know, um, there's a homeless teenager that I've noticed, um, I think she's 15, uh, she's pregnant, um, and she's using substances, do we agree that she meets the threshold for acutely elevated risk? So we need three or more agencies to help her her situation's not looking good and it's probably going to get worse if we don't intervene. If the table says, yes, we meet that threshold, then I'd say, okay, her name is Susie Smith. Um, this is her date of birth. Uh, this is her last known address or generally where she's hanging around. And then every agency at the table, regardless of whether or not you think you've had any type of dealings with her, you would all search your databases because the power of the information sharing is that you might find a piece of the puzzle that you never would have thought of that makes all the difference. And where we see this a lot is with is cases with um, Ministry of Children and Family Development. So, for example, if the police are getting ready to do something very serious, like remove a child from the home um, in partnership with MCFD, sometimes we won't know that there's stepchildren in the home because they're not connected to the police file. Or sometimes because the police work with youth um, typically at the age of 12 when they're chargeable under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. They won't know anything about kids until they're right on the radar at 12. But the school district will know that kid was going down a bad path by the time that they were six. So it's really important that we help each other sort of piece together the puzzle of what's been happening in that person's life through various agencies. Uh, once we've all sort of shared the information and built a bit of a picture about what services this person might need, everybody who is responsible for that specific service would then sort of hive off after the actual table has run its course through all of the clients and you'd plan an intervention. So what that looks like is that you would literally check your calendars and say, okay, uh, when are we going to go help this person? Uh, tomorrow or the day after? And the reason the intervention needs to be quick is because you can't in good faith share information, personal information about a client that you truly believe is in danger of hurting themselves or somebody else and then wait a week or two to help them. Like we, we genuinely believe these people are in crisis. So that's why we're able to share the information and then we need to move quickly to kind of follow that chain. Uh, next slide, please. So how is the information shared? And this sort of ties into the scenario that I just described. So basically anybody um, that's a member of the table, for example, community corrections, school board, health, policing, all of those entities have the ability to bring a case to the table. Um, typically what we see is that the police bring about 85% of the cases and the health sector, health and mental health, lead probably around 90% of the interventions, um, which just illustrates the disparity that we already know. The police are catching quite a lot of clients that don't quite belong in their bailiwick, 
and uh, it does put a little bit more pressure on the social ministry. So we've been doing a lot of inreach uh, with those folks to kind of prepare them for that. So anybody at the table would look at their internal client lists, so students or patients or social client clients, and say, you know, does this person seem like a candidate for the table? Is this person sort of beyond me and another person helping them? Are things not going very well? Are, are they escalating quickly? So if you think they meet that threshold, we have um, basically like an intake form, but it has like a whole bunch of different risk factors. You can tick off the ones that you think best apply to this person. Then you would go to the table and say, you know, I have a referral for consideration and kind of list, um, at this point, you don't list the name or anything like that. I say, I have a client, she's a female between the ages of 18 and 25. Here's her general situation. What do you guys think? Does, does this person meet the threshold for acutely elevated risk? If the table agrees that they do, um, then you share, number three, share their limited identified information, so name, date of birth, um, last known address, and then you plan your intervention. Are there any questions about that? Uh, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next slide, please, Rosa. Thank you. So who participates in a situation table? Um, honestly, it depends on the composition of your community. So I've noticed as we get a little bit further up north that a lot of the community-based organizations or the not-for-profits um, are really powerful. And it's really impressive. Um, in the lower mainland, it's a little bit more of the typical government sort of services that we're seeing leveraged. The, the two critical people that we need to have involved in the table are local and or indigenous government and the police. So the model doesn't work without the police because the police are the ones that are basically driving the clientele that comes to the table. Um, by having the police, by giving them an avenue to refer those vulnerable people, um, in the absence of being able to pay for more police right now, I think you've probably all seen the headlines where the province is in a bit of a deficit, at least what we can do is get the police back to their core duties of law enforcement. And we kind of get them out of that realm of tying up a lot of their time with cases that they can't assist with and aren't meant to assist with. So that's why, that's why this model really is important for the police. And local government, um, for a few reasons, uh, number one, it's just it's poor form for the province to sort of impose anything on local government without your consent and your agreement. And number two, there might be some information that comes out of the table um, that's at the local government sort of level or jurisdiction. For example, if you want to create um, bylaws in response to some of the data that you, that you find or if you, you know, if you want to kind of change any of your, um, I guess, like your security or anything like that, that, that's not in the provincial or federal realm, that's sort of your jurisdiction. Um, we just want to be mindful of the fact that those changes are in your realm and we want to be very clear about that. The other partners are, are some of the usual suspects, and this is not an exhaustive list at all. It's just sort of the core that we usually see. So children and family services, whether that's at the ministry or non-for-profit level, community corrections, um, the health authority is, a, is critical, housing, income assistance, emergency services, and the school board is also very important. Um, sometimes we've seen the fire department uh, be a really, a really focal partner. Um, we've seen that in a lot of cases with elders or seniors who struggle with hoarding, um, which is a big, it's sort of an up and coming thing in the Valley. And it's an interesting one because it doesn't really fit neatly into anybody's portfolio. Um, so what we're, what we're finding is that the hospital will release an elderly person and um, transport them to their residence and when they enter the premises, there's no there's no room for the medical equipment. And so they don't know what to do. do you, I mean, do you phone the police for that? They don't really know what to do. Um, so that would be a really good case for the situation table where it's like, how do we help this person? Who Who's the best fit to help this person? Um, recognizing that we don't want to get them evicted. So it's sort of a fine balance between all of those different factors. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the benefits of the tables, um, the partner agencies have established rules and procedures for information sharing and identifying vulnerable people. So it's all standardized, we're all on the same page, and uh, it moves quite quickly once everybody kind of gets the hang of it. Um, the service providers can proactively connect people to appropriate risk mitigation services. That's also a really nice point about the model is that it makes you optimize the resources that you have in your community. So if you have two non-for-profits that generally serve the same client base, if you're noticing that one has, you know, is pretty much at maximum capacity, you can start to triage to the other one, or you can start sort of pulling people in that have the capacity and the expertise to help or to be sort of leaned on a lot more than we have traditionally in the past. It also cultivates a shared responsibility for personal well-being and community safety. So again, sort of bridging those silos and working in partnership. Uh, next slide, please. 
As I mentioned, the police are the main source of referrals, uh, while the social services providers and the human service ministries provide the vast majority of the interventions. Um, so this model does put quite a bit of pressure on health, mental health, um, in that realm. Um, but arguably, uh, this is where this is where those clients belong. This is where they're best and most appropriately served. This is just a mechanism to kind of make sure that they get to the place they always should have been at. It also allows the police to refer cases, of course, uh, with mental health and substance use and know that they're okay. And it provides the police with a fulsome picture of current cases, um, just sort of based on the information that other stakeholders have, specifically the school district and the health district. Uh, next slide, please. Perhaps most importantly, of course, clients improve their well-being. We want to make sure that our community is safe and healthy. Um, communities reduce demand on emergency and police services. We don't want people going to the ER for overdoses. We don't want people on the streets getting hurt. We don't want people calling the police for non-criminal issues. So it kind of helps to kind of mitigate that before people get to that point. And of course, the provincial partners. Um, so one of the nice things about this model, and I go in it, into another slide, um, I think right after this, is that the model collects data. So the model has a risk tracking database attached to it that generally keeps track of who you're serving with, with de-identified information. So it'll be, you know, um, sex, age cohort, so 18 to 25, for example, um, risk factors. So we have a whole bunch of drop-down menus for risk factors that match the intake form. So we can kind of see after a while when you get enough data, sort of who, who in your community is struggling with what. You can kind of generate a risk profile. And me and my team do those community profiles. We do the data analysis and the summaries for you. So you can start to see, oh, we really have a problem with, for, for example, um, a lot of youth are drinking, let's see, or a lot of middle-aged people um, are struggling with a certain issue. It kind of helps you inform policies and investments based on that data. And so provincial partners, of course, me, and then sort of my side of the ministries, um, because my deputy minister endorses this model, what we can do is provide information up to executive to say, you know, we're noticing that we need to make some policy changes. We need to make a change on hospital discharge, where if you are a patient in a psychiatric ward in a town that you're not from, you can't get released at three in the morning because we're not setting you up for success. We've got to change that. Or, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that we can kind of advocate for at the government level to make more of those systemic changes. Uh, next slide, please. So provincial support. Um, so this is sort of the general overview of what of what I'm able to provide. Um, community outreach engagement, which um, was sort of this session as well as the session in August, where we had a bit more of a like a stakeholder representation. Um, any community in the north that would like to implement this model, uh, we give you a grant of sixty five thousand dollars. In the lower mainland, we give fifty. Um, in the north, I've noticed that you all have this incredible ability to somehow wear four hats and still keep things running. And it's, um, it's, it's incredible. So we actually build in that extra $15,000 for you to be able to sort of give a stipend to somebody to be the chair of the table. So usually people sort of do the chair on the side of their desk. Um, but the North, the North, I've never seen anything like it. It just seems like, um, it, it seems like this would make a big difference. And Williams Lake had told us that where it's like, you know, we can't do much more off the side of our desks. We need a little bit extra to make this run. And I'm, I'm happy to do that. So that money is sort of for a chair position to kind of keep the table running, keep the conversations going, and keep people together. Uh, we also have travel grants available. Um, so, for example, if after this presentation, if you're like, you know what, I still don't quite get how it runs, I'd like to see it in action. Um, I'm happy to send a contingent of you. Um, I think Williams Lake is the closest table. You can go visit them, and we'll pay for that. So if you'd like to go there and they get a bit of a hosting stipend as well, um, you can go, you sign a non-disclosure agreement uh, because there is personal information being shared and you can go and see the table in action. Um, we're happy to do that. Another thing that's kind of nice is if you are able to call your counterparts in the communities that have tables and hear from them from that local government perspective, how it's worked out or what the workload looks like or any types of questions that you might have um, specifically from your perspective. We have a website that makes sure that we post all of our news releases. We're really proud of the model. Um, we host monthly calls for the chairs and co-chairs of the tables. So I want to make sure that we have a handle on everything. Um, if ministries aren't coming to the table, I need to know about it because that's something that I can have some leverage over. Um, it's really nice for each community, too, to build those relationships with each other. Uh, Williams Lake has a really nice relationship with um, West Kelowna because West Bank First Nation is a big advocate in their model. And so the Indigenous connection there was really important. And then we learned from that that 
we need to start incorporating a lot more of an Indigenous lens into the model because it's something in the Lower Mainland that didn't really come up as, as broadly. Um, so we're learning a lot from each other through that community of practice. We have standard information sharing products to make sure that everybody's in step. Um, ultimately, those last two bullets that are kind of grayed out, uh, we're not quite there yet. So we're hoping to get a risk tracking database from Ontario so that we can standardize all of the tables across Canada and then do like a big national risk profile um, to maybe get at the federal sort of influence for policy. And we haven't quite hit the point where we have enough data to do the multi-community evaluation because a lot of our tables are still quite young. Uh, next slide, please. So the startup funding that we provide, um, basically where the money goes is to a consultancy group in Ontario that has basically set up all of their situation tables. The model itself is, is run in kind. So there's no actual money required to run the table. Where the money comes in is to get the training around the information sharing and some of the theory. And then so everybody kind of feels comfortable and confident in the model. Um, so that's why we use those folks. Um, the model itself is, is honestly free, but just that we want to make sure because we're new to it that everybody's trained up really well with the privacy part of things. So it's called the Global Network for Community Safety. Um, they're fantastic. They set up all of the tables in BC and a huge chunk of them in Ontario. So we basically pay for them to come out a couple times. Um, they'll do a community mobilization session where you can invite anybody and everybody who's interested in the model and they'll kind of walk through this theory a little bit more in depth than what I did today and explain the mechanisms of it. And then they do a three-day training session where it's sort of intensive training on the nuts and bolts of the model. And then on the third day, they actually run your table with you. So your table's up and running on the third day. Like you go to work, you grab your cases, it's all sort of in real time. Uh, they'll do a follow-up to make sure that we're, we're complying with a four-filter information sharing approach and just that everybody's sort of happy that no turnover is happening or if it is, we can kind of build that in. Um, with that contract with them, we also have access to online training. So if you do all of a sudden sort of lose a few people to retirement or some people move, you'll always have the option to have new members that join the table refresh themselves with that online module. Um, we give you a laptop just because we don't want to be sort of holding the data on anyone's specific computer. We didn't really know how to handle that aside from giving everybody a laptop. So we're moving more towards like a SharePoint um, for the government. But until that point, we're sort of giving everybody a laptop just to make sure that we're in compliance. Um, yeah, and of course, we pay for the building, the food, and all of those things. Uh, next slide, please. I think this is my last one. Please bear with me. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so this is where we are in BC. Uh, this just sort of shows the extent of our outreach. Um, to be honest with you, there are some communities that, that don't see themselves in the model. Um, some communities have a grassroots approach that works really well for their clients, and we're, we're happy to learn from them as well. Um, there are some communities where we're trying to figure out how the model works with other specialized hubs. So the nice thing about the situation table is that it's not bound by a population or specific risk factor. So we have a lot of models like the ICATS, for example, um, that focus on um, victims of domestic violence, so women and children of domestic violence, and they kind of mediate with, with the, with the um, the male offender. Everyone is a client for the situation table. We're not bound by age or demographic or risk factor. So it's a nice catch-all. So we're still trying to figure that out with a few communities. Um, there are two tables that were implemented before the government got behind the funding. So Surrey was the first table in BC, followed by Mission. So Surrey Mission, and we have Burnaby and Chilliwack, Hope, Kelowna, Penticton, um, we have something called the Greater West Side Hub, which is West Kelowna, West Bank, and Peachland. That table was really important because Kelowna really wanted their own table, and West Kelowna was really adamant that they needed their own, even though they're just separated by a bridge. Um, what we found in West Kelowna was that the West Bank First Nation clients, the bridge was a, a physical and psychological barrier for them receiving services in Kelowna. And what we were told was that unless they can kind of start collecting data to quantify the need, of the people in the West Bank First Nation, Kelowna will continue to get all of the resourcing. So they, they really argued hard for their own table. And now we're sort of helping them build that case for those resources. And of Williams Lake, um, Terrace will be operational in a couple of months. We just issued their grant and they're just in the, in the process of getting the, um, the training done. Uh, so the next slide is, is my concluding slide. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you for your presentation. And uh, is there anybody that has any questions? Council 80. Thank you, Shannon. Um, 
uh, as you mentioned, I was part of the sort of uh, awareness and you know broaching the idea in the community, and I found myself um, very uh, very excited about the flexibility that's involved in this in terms of dealing with individuals and their individual circumstances, which are uh, not the same as everybody else, and also the notion that it moves beyond the RCMP. Um, to the services that are actually going to help people, which I think is, is, is really important in terms of prevention. So before things get carried away, there's a way to intervene. Um, I also felt in those meetings that there was, there was a great deal of enthusiasm around the table in terms of the various agencies. I, I, I think lots of people are really um, enthusiastic about jumping on board and making this happen. So that's exciting. Um, I also think that you know the pulling of people together creates networking, which means that there's different um, awareness about each individual client. So what the school district knows is not necessarily the same as what mental health people might know. And so you can pull that together and, and create a narrative which is going to give you a better response to that person. So there's lots of really good things here. Um, I do have a question about the 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 quick intervention. You talked about um, within 24 hours, you know, responding to um, a client's needs, which is fantastic. What what my question is more around the the front end of that. So, if you schedule meetings, say every two weeks or once a month, is there a provision then for calling together meetings? in a quick way so that the interv intervention doesn't have to wait for three weeks until you have a meeting. Do you mean sort of like an ad hoc conversation about a client? Right. I mean, I mean if, the prin the, if the principle is we need to get a response to a, a, a person's situation within 24 hours or, or 48 hours. Right. And if, and if you're not having a meeting for three weeks, you kind of shot yourself in the foot. So the right. So there, needs so, so there needs to be a way to get around that, right? No, absolutely. And typically we recommend that you meet weekly, um, at the most bi-weekly. So I've never seen a table meet anything sort of further than bi-weekly, um, I think to your point, because a month is a long time to kind of wait and say, like, you know, who's hurting? Who's been hurting for the past three or four weeks? It's a, it's a long amount of time. Um, I would suggest running weekly for that point. Um, what you Like, sometimes what we find, and I think, you know, the north is so different, just even in terms of the weather, I was kind of embarrassed about, you know, talking about snow and like we have no idea what that even means for in terms of an intervention i think you explained that hartley bay like the you can't even like you can't drive there like there like prince rupert is, is very important to us because i think we we have a lot to learn about what that looks like like maybe it's not feasible to go in two days just because of your weather like you maybe you can't take a boat to that island or what have you um so i think honestly the the heart of that premise is that you need to respond as quickly as you can within a reasonable circumstance because you, you genuinely believe that this person's in danger. I hope that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do have two more questions and then sure. let you guys jump in. Um, uh, th there's a, a piece around confidentiality, which you, you kind of talked about a little bit in terms of the training process. I'd just like to you to, like you to, because uh, obviously you, you're talking about bringing a, a fairly diverse group of service providers together and they're going to learn information that needs to be confidential. So, so what are the provisions in place to make sure that that's, that's in place? Um, nobody takes notes during the meetings. Um, if you refer to clients, it's only by their client number, which isn't a number that anybody would have in their specific sort of client load. It would be a number associated with the table. And that's also how we can kind of keep track of recidivism. So if people are coming back to the table, we can kind of know generally which client number they are. So no notes are taken during the meeting. Um, everybody looks in real time on their own computers. Um, the intervention is sort of done verbally. Any notes that are, like anything around that that you kind of bring to the table, um, it's not shared with anybody. So it's all verbal. Um, so there's no written record of that information. Okay. And my last, my last question is around where we're at now. Um, I saw from the second to last slide that Prince Rupert is at phase one which is um, uh, outreach and awareness. So obviously what's next is phase two, and then there's three more phases after that. So could you describe then, based on what you, what you know about where we are, 
what we have to do next? Sure. Um, to be honest with you, I think we've already sort of had, and we did a little bit backwards um, because we already had that session in August, which pulled together a lot of the community stakeholders. So I think we're probably closer to phase three um, because we've sort of done outreach and awareness with the community champions between this meeting and last meeting. And we've had direct engagement with local partners, which is sort of covered again in the last meeting. So now we're sort of at phase three, which is consideration by local partners. So I think what we would need to do, and we can take this offline, um, perhaps I can liaise with, with Blake Ward, is to maybe figure out who wasn't at the meeting in August that needs to know about this model. Because when we fill out the application form, which is, which is not difficult, it's just really a matter of making sure that local government is okay with this and making sure that we have the requisite partners that understand the model and, and agree to attend the table. Um, so the ministries are easy for us because we are able to kind of compel them to go. It's, it's the other folks that you might need that we don't have the authority to kind of tell them to participate, like the health authority, for example. So I think maybe we'll have to go through who attended that first meeting. And if we're missing any critical stakeholders, um, maybe I'll do something like this to them, sort of like a presentation over the phone to kind of run the model past them and make sure that they understand it and, and deal with any questions or concerns that they might have. Okay, I, 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 I'm finished my questions. I just want to thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I think it's a really powerful idea, and I hope. Thank to you so much. Hope to see it move forward. Thanks, Councillor Randawa. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my only question is like, do you have any plan to educate our residents, like uh, how they will find out like these services are, are available? To, to educate the local residents? Yes. We usually do a media release. Um, our minister is really proud of this model. So typically we'll work with local media and our government communications folks will um, typically give a quote from our minister and then they'll attend your community mobilization event. Um, and then usually they'll kind of give a snippet of, you know, Prince Rupert has a situation table and this is sort of what it is. And and then we kind of, that's, a, that's one way we kind of raise awareness in the community. Um, sometimes it's done with them. Um, a sort of a state of the community address, um, if you'd like to do that. In terms of the actual sort of vulnerable people or the clients, we would depend on the service providers at the table to sort of nominate those clients to the table. Um, okay. Where it gets a little bit tricky, and I'm glad that, that you have mentioned that part about sort of partnerships and networking, um, Council AD, is that if somebody doesn't meet the threshold for the table, say they don't meet three, even if it's just two risk factors, you've already had that partnership through the network. So you can still help that person, just not through the table. Thank you. Councillor Cunningham. Uh, thanks for the presentation. This is, this is great if it uh, rolls out properly. In the cities where you're at stage five now, is it at, are the tables actually active? So the cities where I'm at stage five, I think that terrace is the only one that's sort of creeping towards there. And the reason that they're not fully operational yet is that the, um, the consultants haven't, haven't trained them up yet. So they've been issued the grant money. They have the grant money sort of in their account, but they're just waiting on the consultants to fly out and do that mobilization event and then the training. So they're not quite there just because they're waiting on, I think, like just schedules together. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, the key to this whole, whole situation table I see is the provincial agencies buying in and working at it. And you said yourself that... Uh, you know, you could probably put pressure at your end on it because I, I really think the uh, RCMP need a lot of support yeah. in a lot of situations. And f from talking to our local RCMP, sometimes they're not getting it. And it, it's, it's a matter of staffing and things like this. You know, like most government agencies right now are working on the edge as it is. So is there going to yeah. be extra funding for these agencies to step up to the plate and do this? Or is it just going to rely on the resources they have now? Well, one of the things, and that's a really, really good point, um, and we're hearing a lot of, we're, we're hearing that a lot of the ministries don't attend. And then the question is, to exactly to your point, it's like, well, why? Like, what's going on? And inevitably, the story is that people, especially in the social ministries, so for example, uh, Ministry of Children and Family or Social Development, Poverty Reduction, they're understaffed and they're burnt out. And so what this table can show, so for example, if the ministries don't attend, what you can say, and we've had this happen to us actually from one of the tables, they, they provided data to me and said, Shannon, we've had 12 cases now where we needed MCFD and they weren't at the table. So this is what happened. We're, we're able to demonstrate through the risk tracking database that we needed them and they weren't there. So that has to change. 
Um, and then that did change. So I was able to go to MCSD and say, you need to be there or we need to hire more people because this is not allowed to happen. This is your mandate. Um, so it's powerful to be able to hold them accountable, but not, not in a way that's sort of pointing fingers or shaming because what we found is that everybody's tired. The RCMP are tired. Like, I, I get it. We, we don't have a lot, of, a lot of extra resources in the human helping sector, but at least the data can kind of show where we're falling down. And if we need to sort of plug some money into some resourcing there, we have a strong case, an evidence-based data-supported case where we can say we need another worker in Kelowna. Like, this is not acceptable. She's the only person that can do this, and we need another one. So in that sense, it's nice that we're kind of able to, to notice those deficits and something that we can quantify and, and give back to government. Yeah, because right now, from my personal experience sitting on a couple of boards, uh, we just don't have the people in Prince Rupert that could, could yeah. work with this type of situation. And, you know, you're, you're talking about two, three new, new people for agencies up here, and, you know, and the biggest one being mental health. You know, like uh, a lot of the problems with the RCMP stem from mental health problems and that, and it's tying up that resource as well as other resources. Exactly. No, you're exactly right. That's exactly the premise of it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Stelton Morvan. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Shannon. I just wanted to thank you for your time for the presentation. I think uh, a lot of the times with policing in general that uh, for it to become a policing problem, it's usually a social infrastructure or a systematic uh, failure. So when mm -hmm. sy systems don't work collaboratively uh, together, we find a lot of these cases start to increase. And that uh, for us as a rural community, an isolated community at that, and that we don't have the resources to, to meet a lot of these needs. I think that this is an integral part of getting those needs met and that those cases are met so that we don't have folks that are that are feeling hopeless and that they're that uh, you know th and then the, the problems that come after that. So I think this is a really important and integral part of uh, where we can tie these services together and really meet the, meet the needs of every individual that that comes across the table. Thank you. I'm really excited for it. I think that specifically in your community, we're, we're really excited. I think that we have a lot to learn, too. And the more we learn, the, the better we can educate. Uh, Councillor Cunningham? Uh, just a, a quick a ask here. Is uh, any federal agencies involved in this? Because, you know, a, a city like Prince Rupert that draws from a lot of smaller communities and, and people come to our community, and that is very similar to the situation in Williams Lake, and I'd be really interested to see how Williams Lake is addressing this. And uh, also, you know, I, I think in some situations, the federal government should be stepping up to the plate in this as well. So we don't, to the best of my knowledge, we don't have federal government agencies, aside from the RCMP, who are, I guess, technically federal, but they're contracted to the province. Um, I don't think we have any federal agencies I, can't, I honestly can't think of one off the top of my head. Even Health Canada, I don't think, is in the mix. Um, is there an agency that you're, that you're thinking of that maybe I'm, I'm missing? Well, or? there's probably several, but, you know, we can have a discussion about that at another time. Yeah, William Blake is doing really well. Uh, their table is, is, is really moving along. They've had quite a few clients. Um, so maybe we could check with them. And everybody's really open. We have a SharePoint site with a whole bunch of resources, and we have the monthly call in. It's a really nice community. Everybody comforts each other and helps each other. It's um, it's not easy sometimes, you know, when you're when you're dealing with people that are hurting. So it's it's nice to have that support. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And the last question is for myself, and uh, <laughs> this is this is Councillor Nish. Um, I just. Uh, what what do you need from us to move this further? I mean, from the, the from the sounds of it, you have uh, support from council, um, and I guess what I'm asking is, at this point in the in in the process, who's who's kind of leading the charge to get this going? And I understand you've got the funding in place to you know when you get to pick somebody, but what's what's the next step, and and what can we do to help that? I think the next step would be for me to liaise with Inspector Blake Ward. Um, he was sort of leading the charge, and, and he's just my natural contact, just sort of in the policing world. And so I think what I'll do uh, is just sort of loop back to him and, and just make sure that whoever attended that session in August, that we're not missing any major players. Like, like for example, if MCFD wasn't there, I need to set up a call with them to walk them through the model and get their understanding and endorsement. So if we're missing any, or if the school district wasn't there, for example, so our, I think our first step will be to sort of look at that attendance list 
and then we'll identify. And um, Councillor Edie, I can bring you in on that conversation as well. And maybe the three of us can kind of identify any any gaps that we see in terms of who we want represented at the table. We can kind of set up a conversation like this where I, I walk people through the model. And then after that, I can send the application form um, maybe to Blake or if anybody, anybody can kind of spearhead the, the grant application. And what it does is it basically just gives a little bit of context about your community and sort of why a table would fit or work. And then you basically list all the stakeholders that have agreed to participate. Um, it's, it's not meant to be arduous. We, we, we created it. It's just an accountability document for us to sort of say, you know, this is why we gave the money. Um, but I mean, like the answer is yes. So in terms of next steps, I'll sort of get together, see who we're missing, catch up with those folks, um, probably liaise with Blake or somebody in the police to lead the charge on the application, unless somebody desperately wants to, which usually isn't the case. Um, and then uh, I can issue the grant funding. We only have funding till March 31st. Um, so I'll be looking to prioritize that. Okay, well, I don't see any questions from anyone else, so thank you for your presentation, and uh, I look forward to seeing this happen. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> okay, on to the next. Uh, we have... Uh, Number five, reports and recommendations. Uh, 5A is a report from the Director of Operations uh, in regards to the Outfall One Catchment Study Award. Thank you. Uh, the recommendation is that Mayor and Council approve uh, the recommendation of the Director of Operations and award the Outfall I Catchment Study to McElhaney Consulting Limited. Uh, as part of the city's obligations to meet the federal wastewater regulations, the city must conduct an outfall uh, study. Uh, this study is uh, the most significant of all of the studies, uh, and it, what it does is it looks at the condition assessment, flow monitoring, and the collection of all other relevant data towards wastewater. Uh, this was previously messaged to council uh, during the budget and was approved as a capital item. Uh, the operations department conducted an open RFP process that received one compliant bid from McElhaney Consulting Limited for $995,000. The operations department reviewed the proposal and we have a recommendation to proceed with the award. On December 9th, 2019, City Council approved the capital expenditure uh, for Outfall I uh, catchment study. Uh, this will fall within the approved budget uh, of, the, of the capital budget. Uh, so we are recommending to move forward with this study. Thank you. Just one question. So this is, um, <clears throat> uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, did you say that before that this outfall collects about 60% of the sewage for the town? Uh, not, not quite 60, but, but almost 60% of it. Yes, it is our main catchment, so it is the largest catchment area for the city of Prince Rupert. So basically this is just kind of uh, taking care of the, I guess, the the majority of it first uh, as far as moving the process forward for sewage treatment in the future. Correct. Okay, well the recommendation is that uh, Mayor and Council approve the recommendation of the Director of Operations and award the outfall I catchment study to McElhaney Consultants Limited. Moved by Councillor Randava, second by Councillor Cunningham. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any conversation? Yeah. Okay, just okay. Councillor Moreau. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I just have uh, one question. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm glad that the one bid we received is compliant. Um, just in terms of the price, though, and this is just born out of ignorance on wastewater mm -hmm. treatment regulations, uh, I mean, a million dollars for condition assessment, uh, flow monitoring, and wastewater data. Can you provide a bit more context about the nature and scope of the work? Sure, absolutely. So, um, the the catchment areas are the city has a combined system so we have uh, storm sewer and sewer going into the same pipe when you do sewer treatment you look at uh, taking those and separating them which has sewer in one concentrated flow and then and then a concentration of storm water which is rainwater which is called gray water so what we have to look for is convergent divergent points so that where we can take and split off the storm water and get it out of the pipe to concentrate the flow we need to look at condition assessments for manholes, 
uh, for all of the piping uh, to see what areas need to be replaced, where you would twin, where you wouldn't twin. Uh, then we would look at uh, videoing all of them to see if there's bellies and uh, or, or if there's humping, and then just all other relevant data, which is inverts and 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 a whole bunch of stuff like that. It's going to take likely um, about, I would say. 11 to 12 like almost a year to do this we're cameraing every single uh, every single pipe that's in the catchment area and we are collecting all that data for uh, and then we will be submitting it, submitting it to the federal government as well as part of our our administrative directive for wastewater treatment councillor cunningham so it's not just when you when you hear the word outfall you think of just what's out in the water but it's the whole city system itself Correct. Yeah, we are we are going all the way from starting at the outfall and going all the way back. And what it does is it sort of spiders out into a bunch of neighborhoods, and it goes almost all the way up to sort of property lines. So it'll be all of the mains that are within the roadways, uh, and and any any sort of divergent points that shoot off of it, they will all be cameraed and uh, a condition assessed as well. Plus, we can use this data for asset management and stuff as well. So. That was my next question, if, if uh, this would s fit into our asset management plan and that. The other, other question, it being a million dollars almost, and it's a federal wastewater regulation, do they have any grants for us to help follow their rules and regulations? We, we, we will be applying for grants as well. I mean, just because we, we're starting this doesn't mean we can't still apply for grants. So as, as we go on, we are going to apply for grants. Um, as you see with my next uh, report to council, it is for an, an outfall study grant as well. Or Any other questions? Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, 5B, verbal report from the Director of Operations in regards to FCM grant. Thank you. Uh, th this is uh, more of a last minute item. We have the opportunity to apply for an FCM GMF grant uh, for the wastewater treatment feasibility study. Uh, we can receive up to 80% of funding. Uh, so we are looking to move forward with a study uh, that will look at wastewater treatment feasibility within, within the city of Prince Rupert. Um, and so we would like a, uh, approval to through a resolution to apply for this grant. So any 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 monies we get will just reduce costs of, of feasibility studies moving forward. Moved by Councillor Moreau, <coughs> second by Councillor Skelton Morgan. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Six. Uh, a, we have a correspondence from the Prince Rupert Golf Club in regards to a letter of support uh, request for community investment fund application. A uh, recommendation that the council direct staff to provide a letter of support for the Prince Rupert Golf Club as requested. Moved by Councillor Moreau, seconded by Councillor Rendawa. All, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And uh, reports, questions, and inquiries from members of council. Councillor Eddy. <laughs> Let me go first and ask a question about potholes. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry, I, you know, as, as people, there, there are, it, it, people take the, the issue quite seriously, and, and, and right, rightly so. I guess I'm just uh, wondering, I'm not sure who to ask. Um, I, I'm assuming that with the snow on the ground in the last couple of weeks, nothing was going to happen. Um, I'm also hoping that there is a plan for moving forward with some of the more egregious potholes uh, that we're aware of. And, and I'm interested in whether um, which ones get done first is a function of which ones are more serious and if that's kind of built into the plan. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, we um, <coughs> first off, yes, we'll we'll be fixing potholes. Um, I think it's important for council to recognize that the, when you have a thaw freeze cycle, as we've had this winter, which is quite unusual, um, it causes substantially larger and more uh, difficult potholes, uh, um, just because of the weather. There's no way around that. We typically don't have these kind of thaw. 
uh, freeze thaw cycles. Um, and if you're familiar with living in other parts of BC, you will recognize that that uh, a lot of the potholes are generated over the winter because of that process. And we've gone through it in spades this year. So uh, anyway, and then as a result, we will have a lot more of them to fix when the time comes. I have noticed they've been out fixing the critical ones, but hopefully uh, by the time the spring rolls around, they'll be out with their full paving crew and we'll be doing lots of work. Um, so I have something to, is there anybody else that has anything else? Oh, Councillor Cunningham. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, now that we have two bylaw officers and with our 2030 plan and that, is there going to be any emphasis put on the uh, property maintenance bylaw? Because uh, just some of the buildings on 3rd Avenue alone far uh, fall into that uh, property maintenance bylaw and all the different... Uh, aspects of it never mind getting into the uh, the other parts of town the um, we intend to come forward in uh, probably in in the spring anyway uh, and present to council a number of uh, a number of locations that that are not responding at all to uh, uh, to more what I call moral suasion or letters to smarten up and clean up and uh, then council will be required then to pass resolutions for us to act and put it on their taxes but each one of those circumstances will require a show cause hearing notification the people can come and they can talk about it um, so we were anticipating doing that as a special meeting and doing them all at once um, so that's that's what we intended. Didn't really, and uh, well, when we do this, you'll see the level of uh, of problem and its severity. Uh, and I would suggest that council would start with the most severe circumstances and work our way backwards. And uh, so we'll 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 be doing that here in the next couple of months. And I think that's a better approach than trying to deal with this one at a time. So we've already sent out letters. Is that yes. what? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, that's great to hear. At least we're moving forward with it. We have been sending out <laughs> letters now for years. I looked at one, one file. What did we have? Twelve letters that we've sent since I think it was 2015, <laughs> um, and they don't, they don't respond. They don't do anything. So I think at some point, then council will have to step up, and and but council will actually have to step up and and pass resolutions on each one of these circumstances, and they have a right to be heard. So there'll be a process, and then then we can go ahead and act, and then we can put it on the taxes. I look forward to it. <coughs> um, so. Before we do that, I see under reports, questions, and inquiries from members of council that there is a, a, a note um, update from city manager re regarding official community plan amendments. Was that something? That well, we can do that. I did it, it last time. But oh, no, uh, no. Sorry, I'm, I'm being told it's an old agenda. I'm on the wrong, I'm on the wrong page, okay. <laughs> which, which, which I'm quite used to. I just <laughs> thought you may have enjoyed it so much last time, I would do it again. Well, I, I wanted, And I'd be happy to do that again. I, I, want. I wanted the replay. <laughs> I'm at my apologies. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. Do we have a, an adjournment uh, mover? Moved by Councillor Rodawa. Second by Councillor Cunningham. All those in favour? 
Carried. Adjourned. <laughs>